So, hello world. So, hopefully you're seeing a brightly colored PowerPoint slide for accessibility, math, and technical content. And I'm going to go into the slideshow. And my name is Elizabeth Pyatt. I work with within ITS specifically. I'm an instructional designer within Education Technology Services. And I'm one of the people who maintains accessibility.psu.edu. And I put up an email for questions, which is webstandards.psu.edu. That's a listserv that a few of us monitor. So if you have any questions, uh, I would just encourage you to go to webstandards.psu.edu and we can point you in the right direction. Okay. And today I'm going to talk about um, I'm going to talk about how to, what are the audiences that you're trying to help with the accessibility options that we're going to talk about, and some simple fixes that you can do, and by you I mean um, instructors who know where they are and instructional designers who know where they are, um, and some strategies for describing complex images because STEM fields tend to be very visual and have lots of very complicated diagrams, but there are some tricks to being able to describe it in a way that um, doesn't kill yourself and also benefits not just your blind students, but actually all of your students. Same, we'll also talk about data tables and some equation options. We'll talk a little bit about MathML and the future. It's so close to being here, but it may not be here for everyone. And then a, a little bit about color coding. And I will pause. We'll have some exercises, so I'll pause in there just to kind of get a break. So the audiences, uh, I think a lot of us are thinking about the blind partly because, as many of you are aware, the National Federation of the Blind uh, uh, went to court to say, hey, you guys need to be more accessible. But um, there are other audiences. There's a low vision audience, people who have to zoom in and a colored blind audience who can't rely on color coding for alone. And to all these audiences, I have to add that Google bots are also as if they were blind because they can only read text. So if you're ever interested in search engine optimization, a lot of these techniques will help with that. Low vision, we used to again think about people who were traditionally called legally blind and will zoom their screen 200%. But explains why if you go to a computer lab and some of the ADA stations, the monitors are especially large, it's to enable zooming in. However, these days, if you've ever been on an iPhone or a Droid, you also know the um, benefits of designing for low vision. Minimal, maximum content in a minimal amount of space. And color blindness. Um, it's not just people who can't see red and green. Sometimes you're on a weird projector and Colors that looked really distinct on your home computer really don't once you're in the classroom, so always something to keep in mind. Our other audiences that we're hoping to... Oh, by the way, everyone, I'm encouraging everyone to mute their phone so that we don't hear Darius Russell, so thank you whoever did that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, our other audiences that we're hoping to worry about... I'm hearing a very odd tone. Okay, I think it went away. Sorry, getting back, we talked about visual impairments. Um, we're also concerned with cognitive and learning disabilities. Um, in fact, the largest audience of students is seeking accommodations at Penn State are in this category. Is anyone else hearing an odd tone? I hope it's not our phone line. Is anyone hearing us? Yeah, they are. Okay. So. Sounds like a computer tone. Right. Is there anyone? All right. We'll try and go this, but I may have to disconnect the audio. All right. So cognitive and learning disabilities, and actually a reminder that not all students, even students who are, quote, with normal 
learning disabilities or they're not going through the Office of Disability Services. Um, they don't necessarily process STEM content in the same way. So, for example, when I have to go somewhere, I just pull out my handy dandy map and then see what happens. But other other friends of mine can't. Would rather just get driving directions that are text based and maps just are very confusing. So that's just always something to consider. And some of these accommodations will help other students who process information differently. The last one we won't have as much time to cover are motion impaired. These aren't necessarily people in wheelchairs so much as people who can't use their hands easily and it could be that they broke their wrist or I'm getting carpal tunnel. And these people, they want to use keyboards um, more because it's less damaging than using a mouse. And also a blind student tends to want to use a keyboard because it's easier to find and trying to figure out where your mouse is on the screen. Uh, deaf and hearing impaired. Um, the main thing we worry about are captions for video and transcripts for audio. So if you're recording audio, you might want to think about um, if a student requests captions or you want to caption ahead of time how you're going to do that. And we have the information on accessibility.psu.edu slash video. And finally, um, neurological example, different types of epilepsy. Um, you may have heard about don't use blink tag, and that's why, because some types of blinking can trigger seizures and headaches or whatever. So I always say accessibility killed the blink tag from the 90s because it started to be a bad idea. All right, so let's start off with the simple fixes first. So we're going to talk about page titles headings and subheadings, and descriptive link text. And again, these are things that everyone can do. Page titles, easy, easy, easy. <laughs> Partly because if you're using something like Angel or a blog environment or Wikispaces or Drupal or any type of content management system, more often than not, the title field is the document title. So your problems are solved. The ones that we actually worry about are if you're using PowerPoint, we encourage instructors to have a title on every slide. <laughs> and the reason for that is twofold. One, people on a screen reader, they know what slides are on because it'll announce the title so they can um, scroll up and down slides. And the other reason is it does help um, all students understand what the context is of the slide if you have a title. <coughs> And if you have a Word or PDF file, um, you should have a document title and try and use the heading one style in the styles menu. Which leads to our next topic, headings. So headings are things that you might have heard them as H2, H3, H1 tags on web pages or heading one, heading two, heading three in Word and they also exist in PDF files. And these are basically different subsections on a page. So if you are thinking about enlarging your text to mark a section, that's a heading. And this thing, but they have to be properly encoded. And the reason they're very important is screen reader, visual people who can see often will just scan a page and see where the major section headings are and jump to that section of the page. Well, a screen reader does something similar they can call up a list of headers and they can call up a list of links, among other things. And then they can jump to the section of the page that they want to be on. So this is the accessibility page. If they know that they're looking for the top blockers, they can go down to heading, uh, halfway down the page there's a heading three called dot blockers and they can just jump there and go to that section of the page and skip all that text. However, in order to do that for everyone, you have to make sure that you tag your headings as headings. So it's not enough to enlarge your font to 28 point or boldface it or change the color. You have to behind the scenes tag it as a heading that a screen reader will recognize. This is actually not hard. So in the Angel HTML editor and lots of HTML editors, you'll notice a section that'll say heading one, heading two, heading three, heading six. Use those so the 
head page title is heading one. Um, the major section breaks are heading two. Next level down is heading three and so forth. Word also has a similar device. It's heading one through heading six. Actually, Word goes down to nine, which I don't necessarily recommend, but there you go. And you can use the styles component to make, if you know your heading one is coming out as blue and centered and you don't want that, you can, there is a way to change the format of, heading, of a heading style to the way you want it to look. And it will still um, be accessible for screen readers. And if you go to accessibility.psu.edu and look up Microsoft Word, we've got information on how to quickly adjust styles. And finally, PowerPoint again, slide titles and bulleted lists act as headers to help organize content. So actually, I'm going to have an exercise here. Maybe we can enter things in the chat room. So I have this page from Wikipedia about Martin Luther King. And just using the headings, can you can anyone name some people that were influences on his philosophy? Just sort of think about it and put it in the chat room. Okay, I see one person typing. Yep, Thurman Gandhi and Rustin. <laughs> so that's headings actually help students too, so they can sort of start narrowing in important topics. Uh, the next blocker that's relatively easy to fix is link text, and that includes things like a lot of pages that will say, for more information, click here, or they'll have very long convoluted text like learn about additional international resources that might be useful in class or research. Um, this is a common issue that line users complain about. One is they, just as they call up a list of headings, they can also call up a list of links on a page. So on CNN, they might call up the list of links to see what the top news stories are. Um, but if all the links are here, 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 or read more, read more, read more, read more, you're not going to get a lot of information that way. And the same thing, if they're very vague links, they're not going to be helpful for someone on a screen reader to figure out where to jump to. And in addition to that, click here can be hard to find even for sighted users. So there have been several websites I've gone to where I'm supposed to download something and I really can't find the download link because it's not very big, it's this little teeny weeny here link buried somewhere. Um, so that's another reason. And finally, in terms of information architecture, there's a term called link sent, meaning users are happier with websites where they can guess the next destination based on the link text. So even though you have sort of might have explained what here is supposed to go to, because people's eyes tend to zero in on links, they're not necessarily sure where it goes to until they read more, they'd rather just have the link tell them where they go. So an example might be, you can get more information from accessibility.psu.edu or learn more from links, international music links. And again, this strategy works everywhere from Word files and PowerPoint files to Angel pages. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna pause if there are any questions, start typing them in. I'm not seeing any right now, but um, please start sending them in. All right, the next section we're going to be talking about images, which is always a hot topic. <clears throat> it's a blocker because if it's not text, it can't be re read by a screen reader. And frankly, I don't think many computers can read images. So there are lots of systems like Turnitin, which says, nope, we're not going to read your image for me. We can't tell what's in there. So to supplement um, an image, you have to give it a text-based description, and that's called the alternative tag or the alt tag. And you also need to do something similar if you have an image map or something with hot spots or animations, charts, and diagrams. And we'll go through some examples of that. So here's a fairly simple example. I have this logo for the TWT certificate program. 
And if I don't have an alt tag, it's just going to say image, which is not very helpful. But if I say the alt tag is TWT certificate program, then someone who's on a screen reader will know what that image is all about. And it's also handy if the image fails to load on a web page, which can happen when things are going slow and you at least have a clue what's going on on your web page. And this is actually easy to do if you know where to look. So systems aren't necessarily good at telling you, but that's what we're here for. So for example, in Angel, if an instructor uploads an image, there's an alternative text field during the upload where they can put in an alt tag. If you're in Word or PowerPoint, you can right-click the alt tag. You right-click the image, and then there's an alternative text or an alt text tab to look for. Um, in the current blog system, the title is alt text, and other blog systems, it's um, more visible, but it's uh, there. And if you go to accessibility.psu.edu slash images, we link out to common Penn State tools where you can add an alt tag like Wikispaces and other systems like that. And here's the angel um, image uploader, so alternative text right beneath the URL is where you want to put it in. And in Word and PowerPoint, you right click on the image. And in Word 2010, it's called alt text. The newer versions of Word and PowerPoint have an alt text title and description. And the one you need to worry about is description. Um, I think, I don't know why they put title in, because it's not well supported. But <laughs> someday it could be useful. All right, and here's an uh, alt text exercise. And I think I'll do the Saturn one. So. You're teaching an astronomy course, and you have this image from NASA that shows the Earth and Saturn together. And as a comparison, how would you want to describe that to someone who can't see it? And question, and if you could enter them into the chat room. And if you want to do the pyrite crystal one, just for kicks. <laughs> There we go. Carolyn Duda says, comparison of the size between Saturn and Earth. Yeah, would you want to add any more information about, is it twice as large or? Elaine T. Uh, maybe compare them to regular items like a grape and an apple. Yeah, that's a good thought. So Earth looks like a grape. Saturn's more like an apple. <laughs> Jody says, Earth is 1 20th size of Saturn. Yep. So she gives the visual. That's the division. Of it. That's good. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to actually do the other one. So the other one is a pyrite crystal that's twinned. And I'll give you a hint in that I think a normal pyrite crystal would look like a cube, and this doesn't really look like a this sort of looks like a cube, but there's a twerk twist in there. So how would you describe that? Any any risk takers out there? No one. No one willing to risk it. <laughs> Dr. Pyatt had actually tested me with, um, and I had said three cubes intersecting, <laughs> um, and that was the only way that I could describe it. And and that would be pretty accurate. <laughs> so I think the reason I put people through this exercise is to start thinking, how would I really describe it, and not just putting something that doesn't necessarily give as much information as it could. Um, the best uh, trick I know is to pretend you're trying to describe this to someone over the phone. And then you'll know that generally you tend to know which details to focus in on. My favorite one, which isn't necessarily course related, was 
a lot of e-commerce sites will put up um, credit card logos, like they'll accept Visa, MasterCard, and maybe American Express or something like that, but then their image tab will be credit card logos, and there's no other way to tell which credit cards you're actually accepting. So if you're an Amex user, you got to take your chances. All right, now I'm going to go to the even more interesting um, challenge, which is complex images. So you'll know if you have a complex image, if it's you sit there and you're thinking, how the heck am I going to put this in a two to three line alt tag? Well, the answer is you're probably not. You're going to have to do a long description. And those of you may have heard about accessibility for a while, may remember something called the long description or the D-link. And that was basically you were directing people on a screen reader to a separate description. But actually, people are now advocating, including a long description for everyone. Um, and there are several ways to do it. For example, if you have a chart, you, you could actually include a table with the data in it or an outline. And the reason is um, if you do it the other way, it's just you're thinking of it as extra work just to serve a small percentage. And really, that description can serve a lot of the people, the people who are always sure about what to do with the STEM diagram. Um, and the other reason is um, some of these things may be deprecated, not well supported, like there's a long desk attribute which is currently supported by some screen readers, but it's not being advocated for HTML5 because it is invisible and they're trying to save it for things like alt tags where it's critical. A lot of accessibility advocates are very angry at this, so I should mention. So JAWS will probably keep supporting it for a while, but that's sort of the philosophy that we're going into. And I'm going to give a few examples of what the heck this means. So for example, I have this lovely concept map, and this is a case where two, three sen two or three sentences is not going to work because you have to Explain, all right, I have this teaching with technology portfolio at the top, and it's ranging off to teaching philosophies and reflection on technology and courses taught, and there's a page stack, and then there's samples, and that's branching off into blah, 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 blah. That sounds really complicated, and it is. However, there's a workaround for this, which is you can also replicate it as a text outline. So you can present a concept map, and then say you can also view it as an outline, it doesn't have to be on the same page, but you can create a link to it. <clears throat> this is probably going to be a lot easier for an instructor to generate the out original outline that inspired the concept map. And if someone, again, not everyone processes concept maps equally well, so maybe the text-based outline will make sense even if they are visual. And there's a link to the original page where I did actually put them side by side. It's on eps.tlt.psu.edu slash twt slash por capital O organization. And the link is in the PowerPoint. So here are some more examples, and I'm going to give people a longer pause, but um, I'm going to pick the triglyceride, which is the upper one, which is a type of molecule. So I'm, I'm hearing someone shuffling papers again, by the way. Yes, if we could remind you to put your phones on mute, please. And computer tones back. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks. So um, what might you include in a long description for this? And I'm going to work on the triglycerides. Well, first of all, why is it called a triglyceride? There's three, tri meaning three. Anyone want to take a stab at that? Whoa, guys, don't type all at the same time. No. Um, actually, nobody's, everybody, everybody's pretty stumped by, um, yeah. by the looks. There's no, there is no right or wrong answers with these. Um, 
So I guess I'll I'll volunteer and be the guinea pig. Um, one gly one glycerol chain connected by three fatty acid chains. Yep, that's a good way to think about it. So uh, the second one is a fatty acid and Ah uh, Carol, she suggested fatty acids are composed of glycerol and fatty acid chains and. Took the words right out of my mouth. Yep. yep. Thanks, okay. Carol. <laughs> Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Probably the next one will be a little easier, partly because the image, use the image as a guide. So, what are the two parts of the fatty of a fatty acid? And, and you can, I'll let you cheat. I think that the two pieces are actually in the diagram. Uh, another stump. Um, I literally would just say a long hydrocarbon chain molecule connected at the carbon link to a carbolic acid group. Um, so, I mean, a lot of times if the diagram's a good diagram, you can just go ahead and read the diagram to them in the order of the picture. Um, that's the only way I would. Would that be a good description? That would probably be what I would try. And I will say if a lot of you are instructional designers and you're getting stumped on this, you might want to go back to your content expert and say, hey, content expert, can you help me out here? And I would say another... You don't want to copy from a textbook, but you might want to be inspired by a textbook because that's one of the things they do is they'll explain all of this in the paragraphs. So that's sort of the idea. Instead of just throwing up an image on a page, try and write a little bit of text around it to help people who are trying to process this, especially if you're completely online. If you're in a face-to-face -face class, I suspect a lot of instructors are just putting up an image and they're describing the image and they might spend several minutes on a slide. If you needed that information, that would probably be the information that would go into the long description. So, um, similarly, um, I've heard of people that come across anatomical diagrams. And so I'll, I'll go through this one. Um, in the interest of time. So we have a small intestine, and um, this is from a nutrition course I did, in case you're wondering. <laughs> but you can see the small intestine is a bunch of tubes that's sort of tightly packed into this small area. And the next one is if you do a cross-section of it, there are these little tiny finger projections, um, and those are called the villi. And in fact, you zoom into the villi, which is actually a bunch of teeny little fingers just sort of sticking up. And that's actually where the nutrition is absorbed at the end of the so your stomach starts breaking things down and you know you go through the large intestine and break things down some more and you get to the small intestine and things are your big burger has been broken up into its component nutrients. Um, some of which you need, some of which you probably don't, and then the villa just suck it all in. Different molecules. Elaine asks is it necessary if the image is already explained in the regular text? No, that's the beauty of this. If the image, if you have a description in the text, your alt tag can say um, cross section and small intestine with villi, read, read information below. So thank you, Elaine. That was exactly what I was trying to say is you can cheat by using a description somewhere else, and you should. I worked twice as hard. So my next topic are tables with um, captions and headers. I wanted to show you this is, we are advocating that most data tables look like this so that there's a caption meaning color names in multiple languages is the caption for this table. It's the title of the table. And it also has headers meaning the top row and the left column. So the top row we know is color words, um, Spanish, French, Irish, and Welsh. In the left row we know that we have black, white, red, green, yellow, 
And there are different ways of making sure that the top row and the left column are marked as headers. And this is important. One, it's important for everyone to kind of, you know, title of a table. What does each row and column mean? This is actually information that we think students understand, but they may not, so we should make sure it's there. And for screen readers, the headers are important because they add information about data. So you'll see that I have two representations of when. So one of them, if you don't have headers properly coded, when you get to the cell it says Gwen, the screen reader is just going to say Gwen, and unless your family knows Welsh or you've happened to book in Welsh in your past, you're probably thinking, well, what language is this? Is this Welsh? Is it Gaelic? Which color is this? I can't remember without going back and forth, and that can take a lot of time. But if the headers are all there and properly tagged, when you get to a cell, ideally you'll get a reading like Welsh <coughs> color, language Welsh, color white, Gwen, so you'll know what it is. Carolyn asks, should the footnote about the headers be at the top of the table rather than at the bottom? The footnote about the headers. On the last screen? Yes. It's an image, so this is used for an example. Um, it, the caption itself can be aligned to be at the bottom or the top, depending on if that's an issue with visual presentation. The note here is just to rem this is actually on a website that I took the screen capture from. So that's why that footnote's there. Does that okay. help? Uh, just let, yeah. let us know if that helps, Carolyn. Okay. Good questions. So that's why we um, are worried about headers. And also, some people distinguish between headings, which are the subheadings in a text document, and headers, which belong to a table. I get them confused all the time, so. You probably will too. <laughs> the other thing about tables that we advocate is simple tables, meaning basically no merged cells. Each row is one type of data. Each column is another type of data. The reason being they're easier to accessify. Even if nothing else has gone right in your table, um, a user on a screen reader can kind of jump up and down between cells and sort of get a sense of the structure of the table. Complex tables, they're very popular, especially in STEM textbooks, where I think they're trying to save on space, but they are hard on screen readers. I'm not sure they're always user-friendly, and I'll give a few examples. Um, if you're on the web, they're really difficult to maintain, and even in PowerPoint, you get some weird things happening. So try not to do those. There are other ways around them, especially if you're going online, and I'm going to give some examples of some common errors. Oh, I did want to talk about if you're doing a table in Angel, it actually has some really good tools. You see there's a caption area, and the summary is additional information that a screen reader might need. I tend not to use it because I try and structure my tables to avoid that, but things happen. You might want to use it. And headers. So in Angel, you have option for row, column, or both. I would either use both or um, make sure the first row, that's get the most bang from your buck that way. So um, here we have my table, the Mount Olympus Board of Directors, and there are two problems in this here, that it's deviating from the ideal table structure. Does anyone want to give a shout out to what they are? Some of you may have seen this example before from another presentation. Susan uh, says merge to the top of the cell. Right. Um, Jody, not a title for both columns. And Carolyn says merge cells, no captions. And Jennifer says no title. Exactly. So we're missing the caption, which is the title. And we've got these cells merged. Actually, we're not technically missing the title. This is the title, but it's also screwing up the header. So you don't really know what these two columns mean. You can guess at it, but you're not sure. So this is CSS or web styles in action, but you can do this in other platforms. So this is the caption, Mount Olympus Board of Directors. 
If you want to get fancy schmancy, you can make it look like a tab, but you don't have to. You can just center it. And we have the office and the deity name. So we have actual headers. Yay! And I think it looks better myself. <laughs> Here's another one. So again, what are the problems in this? This is a classic. It's just also showing you that foreign languages and um, social sciences can also uh, do some things with tables that are interesting. But he's reading the table. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it does assume you know Latin, I have to confess. <laughs> Don't worry, when I took other languages, French, Spanish, it always confused me because they would start to just leave that stuff out as a, to save ink, I guess. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carolyn says, no title, no column heading, merge, merged cells. Yep. Uh, Susan's also typing. Uh, they leave out they leave out the person first, second, and third. That's right. <laughs> so yeah, the problems are these cells are blank. You have no idea what this row means. And these aren't just merged cells. I think they just are missing cells they, in the HTML. If you don't know Latin, you're wondering what the heck are these four words here. And, you know, hopefully you know what indicative is, but <laughs> that's about the only information you're getting. So my solution is, first of all, you might want to start breaking up tables because really these are just like a series of tables with the same structure. So if you're repeating the same information every few rows, that's probably a sign you might want to split up the table. Um, this fills out all the information for a second and third person. This kind of tells you what the heck is going on, tense mood by number, and at least you get a translation of the verb up here. And you can start combining it with headers as well if you have a whole bunch of tables you have to deal with. <laughs> and then my favorite table, which again, some uh. of you see. <laughs> and again, proof that complex tables aren't just in the technical sciences. So I'm not, actually I'm going to have a discussion now. Just sort of vote if you like, put in the chat, if you like if you find this okay, click uh, put in okay. If you find this confusing, put confusing in the chat. I should have set up a poll for this. Yeah. Next time. Let's see. Uh, Jennifer says confusing. Uh, Susan says, what would they do with the periodic table? Yikes. Yeah, that is an interesting question. I'll have to. <laughs> Emily says confusing. Elaine says the same, confusing. Uh, Susan says confusing. Carolyn says, okay. Okay. Um, makes me wonder, Carolyn, are you in history or art history? Because um, mm -hmm. this reminds me of an art history, uh, an art history type of format. Um, Deborah says, confusing. It just makes me think uh, this actually would confuse multiple uh, people with different, various different accessibilities. Um, what if you're colorblind with blue? Yeah, exactly. Now, the reason I asked if you like this table because I've gotten interesting responses. When I presented this example to instructional designers or people, the general consent or writers and editors, the general consensus has been, "What the? What is this? <laughs> what are you trying to do to us?" But when I present it to people, programmers, they love it. So this is an example to me of um, how different people want to process information differently. So I'm going to give a suggestion of how to do an alternative for it, but you don't necessarily have to kill this. You can keep this if you really like it and it just rocks your world as an instructor. 
you just have to keep in mind that not everyone is going to understand it. You might want to think about in terms of accessibility and alternative and include that as well, even if you link to it. And that alternative is not the table, but a list. So if you find yourself kind of doing weird nesting things in your um, tables in very strange layouts, it might be a list. And I haven't looked at the periodic table closely, but I suspect if you had to do a version for the blind, it might end up being something like a list or a bunch of tables put together. And I wouldn't want to get rid of the traditional periodic layout visually because it's so well known in the chemistry field, but you might have to have an alternative. And this would be, I would actually have both of these out there, and in fact, I probably would do it as a list even if I color coded. Okay. And the other benefits of charts and tables, I did want to point out that I skipped over graphs. Um, so there's another complex image that you would kind of take you a while to accessify, but if you have the data table behind it, and a lot of people actually do have the data table because they're using a program to generate the pie chart like Excel, mm -hmm. then just include that also. That helps with the color coding issue. It helps um, lay out exactly what all the percentages are. You don't have to replicate that. It's all there for you. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's the end of tables. So next section, equations <laughs> and exotic symbols. So by exotic symbol, I mean things like arrows, phonetic symbols, math symbols like the one of the um, integral symbols, it's a path integral of some sort, the summation symbol and subsets, and currency symbols and emoticons, which a lot of systems just like to put in. <clears throat> and best practice is to make sure these are encoded as text and you use Unicode, which is a system which assigns a number to every symbol in the known world and then that allows you to transmit data between email and web pages and so forth. However, some screen readers, screen readers like JAWS don't rec recognize most of them by default, so even JAWS isn't quite sure what to do with the right arrow that's up there, which just amazes me, but it's true. Um, the solution isn't to avoid using Unicode, but to fix JAWS, so there's, I have a long um, URL here, but basically it goes to a blog entry I wrote, which tells you how to update the JAWS symbol file. And we'll probably move that into the accessibility.pc.edu. But basically what that does, so suppose you are in economics and you want to include the new rupee symbol of India, which came out last year, and you are able to determine that its code number is 20B9. You would just add a num you would just say U plus 20B9 equals rupee symbol. Susan says, interesting, in a stats class, I've seen them use text, S-Q-R-T, rather than the symbol. Wonder if that's accessibility. Is that an... It probably is both accessibility and web display issues. Okay. And if you explain what S-Q-R-T means, it's not really a problem. It, you know, it's not as pretty, but it does get the job done. The good news is, um, if you go to the link on the previous page, there are... SBL list available for math and phonetic symbols that people have done for us, and you can even look them over and make sure they're what you want them to be and um, hand them out to students. Um, some screen readers, Mac VoiceOver being one of them, actually says a lot of the math symbols by default. I will say if you are doing a particularly exotic language, um, so in JAWS, if you're doing a language like Chinese, you would need to find a language pack for Chinese. And then there may be some languages that are really, really exotic that don't have language packs, but I'm not sure they're taught at Penn State, to be honest. <laughs> Lucky for us. Someone might have developed something for them anyway. <clears throat> so the last part is probably what we're thinking of, which is equations like x plus 1 over uh, parentheses x plus 3 squared. Um, 
the equation editor is your best friend in this case. So this is, they come in Word and PowerPoint, but you can also get um, commercial ones like Math Type and Math Magic for the Mac. And they come with all these palettes to let you insert, um, you know, equations. So like if you wanted a fraction, you would look for this palette and you'll get a fraction line with two slots and you build up from there. Angel has an HTML, has a math equation editor like this, but it's not too accessible at the moment. The good news is I think a lot of um, STEM instructors know how to use this because they're doing it for other projects, or they know something called LaTeX, L-A-T-E-X, which looks like LaTeX, but apparently it's really LaTeX or LaTeX, because <laughs> it's a chi at the end. Um, so once you, and the reason I mentioned that is if you are an instructional designer, you can take someone's LaTeX equations and kind of and paste them and believe it or not, they'll be magically converted to something that looks like an equation. And then there are two things you can do. Um, the old school method is to export it as an equation, as an image and add an alt tag to it. And then the alt tag has to make it legible so this is blank flaw. So something like um, E sub wavelength lambda times B equals 2 pi Planck constant HC squared over lambda to the fifth times parentheses E to the HC with H is Planck's constant again over lambda K sub T minus 1. Again, if you're an instructional designer, you might want to have your instructor help you with that. Um, and the, what a lot of statistics professors are doing are doing things like SQRT and X bar instead of X with a bar over it. That's fine too. Um, the alt text image works, but images can pixelate when they're zoomed and they're hard to edit and um, alt text can be awkward. It would be nicer if we could just get it all done at once and that's where MathML is coming in. And it's literally a math markup language similar to HTML. So if you recognize HTML, you'll sort of recognize these angle brackets. So um, I believe this was, the again, Planck's equation I was using before. So there's a lot to it. So you don't normally hand edit uh, MathML, by the way. Again, you use your friendly equation editor, which I'm going back to. Your friendly equation editor and you can export. And again, if you have instructors who are used to working with LaTeX, they can cut and paste the LaTeX in here, export it out to MathML. Now, the final challenge has been making sure that your browser can read it <laughs> and display it properly and that the screen readers know what to do with it. Um, sort of without doing a lot of JavaScript, um, the best browsers are Firefox, four and later, IE9. Um, with Math Player 3, that's a plugin from Math Type, you have to have both an IE in order for it to work on JAWS, and that's sort of our target audience. You can display MathML on Safari 5.1, but it's a little quirky. And there's still no support in Chrome, even though Safari and Chrome are theoretically based on the same browser, but there's something going on there. So we're still having some browser words. You might also want to install a MathML font like Styx that's um, from a math consortium. So that's free on the web. And I kind of messed around with things. Um, so basically, I can get it to work in Angel, but you have to do things like create an HTML5 document, which isn't that hard to do, but you just have to have the right headers. I was able to export MathML from the equation editor, and in this case, I needed something which is called the namespace option, which is a link to where the MathML specification is in the first line. Then I can embed that code into the HTML file, and then I take that HTML file and upload it into Angel. Um, because I tried to cut and paste it into the HTML editor, and it just wouldn't work on IE9, which is very ag aggravating. So the upshot is it's not 
quite ready for all, all instructors to use unless they're really comfortable messing around with HTML and using Dreamweaver or something like that. If you can use Dreamweaver, it's not too bad, but not everyone does. In this kind of way, you can get Angel to work on, uh, MathML to work on Angel. Um, you can take MathML code with the namespace, pop it into the HTML view in a blog, the movable type blog system, and it'll work. Same thing with Drupal. Um, I haven't been able to get it to work everywhere, so it's definitely a lot of experimentation going on. Today I did learn about there's, um, Earth and Mineral Sciences uses something called MathJax, which is a JavaScript library they installed on their server that enables the processing for more browsers, and they can also convert LaTeX into readable MathML for a screen reader. But again, that requires someone to have access to a server and mess around with it. So it's coming soon, but it's not quite there yet unless you know Dreamweaver. So we are actually amazingly about to wrap up. So where were we? Um, I think the focus is on tables and diagrams and equations are probably the takeaways for STEM. And just about everything we've talked about is going to benefit um, not just blind users, but some other segment of the audience. Hopefully watch for more math ML support. And since we have time, I should add that if you are um, experimenting with video, um, you want to make sure that whatever you put in your video that you're going to caption, that you explain everything on the page. So don't just start pointing to things and saying, start here, start here. Read things out because otherwise you'll have to add an additional audio description for the blind. So if you're like deriving an equation, you want to say what every step is so that you don't have to do extra work at the end. So it's a lot of it's a little bit of planning, but it really will benefit everyone and and it's good reinforcements for the for the students without disabilities. It is. I agree. Yeah. So if we have any questions, um, please feel free to type them in now. Um, Carolyn did ask earlier, can we get a copy of your PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Now, um, I said that there's a possibility we can make a link on the website. Yes, I'll okay. look, look. We, I just added some things over the weekend. So. <laughs> um, we have accessibility.psu.edu slash math where kind of I summarize this and then lead people out to detailed. Su uh, Susan d d does ask about video tips um, too. So, and then Kim, uh, Kimberly, can we also listen to the audio recording later? Yes, um, I'll send this out uh, probably tomorrow um, through training. Um, it won't be captioned, but then we're going to make sure we do caption this and put it up on the public website. And then finally, um, we did a section on complex image accessibility, which goes through even more examples such as maps and um, a little bit more on charts and um, screen reader or if you're doing screenshots for documentation. Although if you have questions now, you can ask. And finally, I want to recommend this NCAM STEM diagram accessibility. That's out of WGBH. They have a lot of other good examples um, of how to do a complex diagram and do a uh, text-based description. Okay. Plenty of resources for us. Plenty of help. And uh looks like no other questions. Uh, anybody else? Well, I know we got, that was a dense hour. If you have questions you can't think of right now, please feel free to go to webstandards.psu.edu. In fact, Donnie, could you type that into the sure. chat room? Thanks. You said web standards? Yeah. And that goes to a list. Yeah. And that's it? Yeah, web standards app. Okay, thanks. And um, please fill out the survey. If you get a link for a survey, um, I might send out a second link to a survey um, for the diversibility committee. I find it, but thanks.
for coming. I see people are hanging up. I'll be around for a few more minutes. Lots of thank yous. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> Hey, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill's still the only one hanging around. Did you have any questions, Bill? <laughs> You're the only one here. <laughs> All right, I'll probably, well. All right, I think I'm going to stop the audio, which will hang everyone up. But. <laughs>